Welcome to the Social Housing Podcast from Voicecape, the only podcast dedicated to helping social landlords build sustainable tenancies. During this series of podcasts, we'll be speaking to leaders from the social housing sector and beyond, hopefully challenging the status quo a little bit, and also stimulating discussion around how technology can be better utilised to help build sustainable tenancies. I'm your host, John Doyle, the Chief Exec and Founder of Voicegate. I mean, at the time the, the pandemic hit, I think the, the one thing that I probably should mention there is we'd already started then looking at our agile working program um, in terms of then not just focusing on the customer and what the customer needs, but how we can equip colleagues to do that best in a more agile way. And so agile working, where we moved to was um, there was a recognition that if we kitted out colleagues with the right kit, they could work from anywhere any time, any place. And that stood us in really good stead. You know, when the pandemic hit, we were able to, to yeah. move um, all of our office-based staff to home working within 24 hours. Transformation, change and continuous improvement are words and phrases that are often overused in the social housing sector, which to many observers suffers from a high degree of cultural inertia. I'm particularly interested to hear about the journey of 13 Group from their Executive Director of Business Change and Improvement, Heather Ashton. Welcome to the Social Housing Podcast, Heather. Okay, Heather, Executive Director of Business Change and Improvement. That's quite an intriguing title and I'm keen to understand a bit more. But in the meantime, for those listeners who don't know that much about 13 Group, I wondered if you could give us a bit of background. Yeah, not at all. So primarily based in Teesside, uh, with 34,000 units, uh, we manage a few more than that, but that, that's the stock holding. We're located um, quite geographically over a wide area now, so as far north as Morpeth, as far south as York, across to Darlington and, and over to the, the coast on Whitby. And most recently, we've acquired uh, quite a significant number of units in the Humberside area as well. Um, so growing geographically, certainly into, into Yorkshire. 1,600 employees. We came together, formed from two groups, Fabric and Vela, back in 2014. We have uh, a traditional landlord in there as well as some stock transfer landlords. So we have quite a diverse business model as well. Uh, so not just your typical house, you know, st- uh, social housing landlord, but we have quite a big care and support provision. We build out for, for sale, for private sale as well as for affordable. We're strategic partners with Homes England and we have our own in-house uh, DLO, if you still call them that. We still have have our own in-house DLO as well. So, you know, quite a big organisation with quite a diverse range, a diverse range of, of, of service offers. Brilliant, brilliant. Now, as an established client of VoiceGate, we already know that 13 are a particularly innovative landlord. But when we chatted recently, I was, I was quite taken by how seriously you're taking that at a senior level. Uh-huh. I wonder if you could just tell us a bit about that. Yeah, yeah, it's something that as ever as a, as a leadership team you get together quite regularly and look at you know your strategic plan and, and your strategic direction and and what we realized when we were chatting was that you know often um we have the typical exec structure where you've got your resources director operations development assets and all of that but you know when it came to growth opportunities and change opportunities and change on a significant scale it was often done as part of someone's role so we 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 kind of thought through what our strategic strategic needs were and with the support of the board we created two new directorates so a business growth directorate and a business change directorate and moved parts of the business into those two directorates bringing the right teams together with then a real sort of strong message to everybody in the organization as I say supported by the board and and hopefully recognized by stakeholders that we're taking growth and and and, um, change and improvement seriously and that we're actually putting the resources behind it. Brilliant now you mentioned Tees Valley, and I know that you've got aspirations to grow beyond the Tees Valley. Uh-huh. And when we talked, chatted before, you talked about stripping down your operational model to sort of increase your geographical footprint. Uh-huh. I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions on that. First of all, why is that important to 13 strategy? Uh-huh. And what do you see as the key considerations in terms of achieving that? 
Mm -hmm. I mean, fundamentally, it's about growing and diversifying your income at the end of the day. If you've got all your eggs in one basket, as I would put it, um, and having all of that, you know, most of our stock holding in the Tees Valley, which is, you know, you will recognise it's quite a deprived area. The rents are very low. Your opportunities yeah. to, you know, even if you go into private uh, rent, it, the opportunities to increase your rent or, or, or create more income are quite limited. So looking at our geographical footprint and looking at how we could diversify and grow our income, you know, I've mentioned we've got properties in York, you know, parts of Yorkshire where we can command higher rent levels and then, you know, look yeah. to obviously cross subsidize the business model. So that that was probably one driver that was that was kicked off uh, originally by the, you know, the rent cut uh, many, many moons ago now, uh, or the rent cap, I should say, which we're, not, we're now at the end of, but that really did change our focus of thinking back then. But then it also made us think about, so what's important in terms of the core customer delivery and how can we streamline that and again, reduce cost to protect our income and then use that as a model to roll out our, you know, our customer model to, to wider geographical areas. Um, if that makes sense yeah okay but in terms of so i get the the why uh -huh. in terms of how that's your main considerations what was the what would you consider to be like the biggest hurdle in achieving that yeah, well, if I go back a couple of years ago, we, we the first thing we did was look at our operating model. As I've mentioned there, there was the rent reduction. Everybody, you know, all housing associations were not unique in that. We all kind of had to do a bit of a sit back and say, right, how can we continue to deliver really good services, you know, upper quartile services, which we pride ourselves on whilst trying to reduce costs. And, you know, ultimately any housing association, when you look at the main costs that we're incur incurring, it's staff costs and then material costs, you know, at the end of the day in terms of repairs and investment yeah. and then delivering your housing services so that's when we started to look at the business operating model and how we could actually um, deliver those services in a more joined up way so you know there's the usual cycle of going from generic housing officers to bespoke and specialist units and we'd got quite a lot of specialist teams and they were growing so what yeah. we did was we kind of took that step back and thought about right how do we uh, streamline the, the customer service delivery while focusing on the customer absolutely but how can we streamline that and actually make that easier uh, and more cost effective to deliver? And we introduced a neighborhood model where we actually brought all of those teams together, reduced the headcount and delivered services to much smaller patches. So started to have that more one to one relationship with customers. We were out on the patch a lot, you know, um, and, and, and what we recognized was a neighborhood coordinator, as we call them, could do an awful lot more if they had a smaller patch and built that relationship. Yeah. which was brilliant a couple of years ago and served us really well. Um, <laughs> it did kind of, yeah. you know, set us up uh, or, or almost increase customer expectation in terms of that face to face, you know, because they got used to the, the, the person that was on their patch. And, you know, as I know, we'll come on to talk about when you then strip that back, uh, then that kind of gives you an issue as well. But, it, it, but at the end of the day, the core model about only delivering what you need to deliver and really focusing on the customer services that they need and stripping back on all the, the stuff that people don't want and, you know, really focusing your efforts on the areas that, that, that need that help. That, that really helped us then, you know, move on, as I know we'll come on to talk about in terms of how we've moved the business model on since. Yeah, I think it, you're right. That leads us nicely, Heather, into the, you know, how has 13 responded, like every business has had to, into the, the new world order post-pandemic how was, you know, you mentioned that little bit of a journey there, but if you just want to continue it, I think that would be really interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, at the time the, the pandemic hit, I think the, the one thing that I probably should mention there is we'd already started then looking at our agile working program um, in terms of then not just focusing on the customer and what the customer needs, but how we can equip colleagues to do that best in a more agile way. And again, thinking about just stripping back on, on, on you know, the, co the cost per unit at the end of the day. And so agile working, where we moved to was um, there was a recognition that if we kitted out colleagues with the right kit, they could work from anywhere any time, any place. And that stood us in really good stead. You know, when the pandemic hit, we were able to, to yeah, move yeah. Um, all of our office-based staff to home working within 24 hours very quickly. I mean, it wasn't perfect from day one, don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, there was a lot to no, do. But, 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 you know, literally one day we took the decision just ahead of the lockdown to send, you know, guys home. 
and we were working from home I think it was around the 17th of March before we went into lockdown around the 20 something of March in, in 2020 and that was because of, of, of how we'd looked at how we could equip colleagues to have the information that they need at their fingertips on the right piece of equipment that they need so you know everybody either, either has a laptop a mobile or a, or a tablet device so that they can carry work with them and then we the mantra was work is something you do and not where you go so that was kind of we were getting yeah. people ready for that way of working and that really really helped as I say it wasn't perfect but it meant that we could we could switch on that way of working quite quickly 18 months ago yeah and I remember as when we chatted you you know you talked about this notion of home Rome and uh-huh. hub uh-huh. which as you say anytime any place anywhere I remember that uh-huh. used to be a martini advert it did the yeah 70s, we're of a certain age aren't we John? yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I like that. But then a couple of things that struck me when I spoke to you about this prior was that it's not just a question of that notional where you might work, or working from anywhere. Something that struck me was you took it down to the T's and C's of uh-huh. people's employment contracts uh-huh. as, as phase one. Uh-huh. And, and notwithstanding that, <clears throat> the whole world and its brother has got to start adapting working uh-huh. terms uh-huh. for for employees because of the new reality Uh but again you've gone much further than that Uh I think what you told me recently about 13 you've gone much further than that so could you just speak towards that a little bit yeah yeah I mean obviously you and I have had that conversation but people listening won't know so as part of permanent making the current working arrangements permanent which every organization will be doing what we've looked at is we've looked across the workforce and said okay what have we learned over the last 18 months um, what can we embed what can we benefit from and to help colleagues understand just exactly their role and how they fit in and how they are supported um, within the organization it, it sounds a bit archaic but we've classified colleagues into one of four groups home roam hub or trade operative uh, or operative uh, because we've got yeah. quite a few of I shouldn't say trade operative I should say operative because that encompasses your care and support staff as well which uh, you know again an essential frontline um, set of colleagues that we have within 13 and um, so then we're very clear if you're a home worker this is the kit that we give you to support you working from your home we've done full DSE assessments to make sure that they can work safely in their home but we've also said you know but don't forget there's some opportunities when offices open back up you can come and work from the office from time to time but prior Priorities given to those who need to be in those spaces. So just being dead clear and dead honest and dead open within all of our kind of working at 13 guides that we have, you know, this is the package for you. Um, so when, you know, colleagues who are now in that position, they understand and anybody who wants to come and work at 13, they can clearly see what the offer is. The same then goes for a Rome colleague, which is somebody like myself who can largely work from home. And we'll continue to largely work from home, but often there's a need to be present somewhere um, in terms of, you know, going to a meeting or meeting the board or, you know, the tenants or local resident groups or just being seen to be out and about on the patch because it's really important. That's something that we held on to strongly at 13 was, you know, we don't just sit in, in our offices, we get out and about and whenever we could and can throughout the pandemic often we have tried to go out to make sure that we can meet colleagues when it was safe to do so so again a Rome colleague is very much like a home colleague but they have all of the the t's and c's there hub colleague will be located from one of our offices and then your operative carries on working as they are but I think hopefully the sense you're getting is to start with that then colleagues first and foremost understand their role and what the offer is from 13 and then we can be very clear about how we then work with them going forward that makes sense yeah it does I think it, what comes out of that for me is a sense of security yeah. it's not just it's this week's idea and it'll be different next week yeah it's you know it's been considered and it's, yeah. it's got a sense of permanence which has got to be good yeah and then sorry I was going to say where that then takes us is laying that foundation and embedding what's worked well through the pandemic we can then start to think about okay then how can we improve that How can we improve it if if your lot, if you are a home worker, you know, it might work for you to work evenings rather than nine to five. You know, nine to five doesn't happen anymore, does it really? Um, Whether we like it or not. So as a home worker, if you can deliver your role and deliver outcome, because it's more about outcome focus now. um, And if you can do that, working on an evening or condensing your hours so you only work three or four days a week, 
brilliant you know share those ideas with us and we'll look at um as long as we can still deliver the right outcome we can still continue to deliver customer services then then we're quite happy now as we start to move into phase two which would just start in because we're just finishing off laying the foundations then that's the sort of stuff that we want to do same goes for any of our operative or frontline workers if they think there's a different way they can deliver their service and and still be productive and maybe more productive then you know give us those ideas ultimately we will become a 24 7 organization now that's not to say that people will be there 24 7 but with a combination of people working in the way the right way that they can and then applying technology automation ai etc we will then start to really develop that much more 24 7 model whilst not necessarily over sweating your human assets but actually hopefully giving everybody the benefit of working in the way that they want to work at a time that suits them while still delivering the business Okay, that, that sounds brilliant. I like that idea about everything being based on outputs. Obviously, I run my own business. I have the same kind of challenges. Giving the uh, decision, passing the decision-making process down to individuals to sort of create their own hours sounds like a bit of a risk. And I'm sure lots of people in our position look at that going, okay, how do we mitigate that risk? So I'm curious as to what's 13 doing in that situation to mitigate the risk of people just getting used to working from home and not doing the right lot, potentially. Yeah. Well, trust is the first word that comes into it there. You're, you, you know, you're right, John. It, it is all based on trust. And this is something that um, uh, we've been very conscious of at 13 for quite some time now, you know, regardless of the pandemic and how we're working now. Trust is very much about, you know, when it comes to writing your HR policies, write them for the majority and not the minority. Because often when you pick up a pile of HR policies, you'll see, you know, it says thou must not do this, thou must not do that. Because at some time, two or three percent of the organisation has done those wrong things. So you end up writing all your policies to say, well, you can't do this and you can't do that. You can't do that. We now turn that around and say, look, as far as we're concerned, you can do this, this and this. Then if you break the rules, then we will hold the right to come and have a word with you. And, you know, we'll take you through that process. But, you know, simple things like and I know I've kind of deviated away from your question a bit, but I think hopefully it gives you a sense of, of, of that, how yeah. we operate. Um, you know, things like dress code in our working at 13 guide, it basically says dress appropriately for your day. So if you know you're going to be out and about meeting an important client or a stakeholder or you're going to be out visiting, visiting customers, then dress appropriately. If you're going to be working from home, then that's fine. Be more relaxed. You know, wear your slippers if you want. Nobody will say, but don't look like you've just got out of bed. But literally, our policy just says dress appropriately for your day. You know, because lots will say you must wear this, you must do that, you must do the other. And, you know, for the majority of your colleagues who work for you, they're thinking, hang on a minute, they're laying all these rules on me and I'm not I'm not stupid. You know, I'm, I'm not I'm yeah. not going to do that. So I think <clears throat> my first point is trust your colleagues to do the right thing and write your policies based on that basis, write them for the majority and not the minority. And then you build that confidence again like it's about like we've said, people understand their role, what they get from us, what we expect from them. You know, it's a two way thing. Um, and then really beyond that, you know, trusting colleagues to deliver the output. As all organisations, we've got, you know, a series of performance measures. So we'll be able to tell through the finances, through the performance metrics, you know, void levels, debt levels, repairs, all of that. You can see whether colleagues are being productive or not. And I think probably the other unique, it might not be unique, but, you know, something that I think we probably try and adopt at 13 is not having managers pouring all over the performance data um, and trying to sort of, again, catch people out. Use that performance yeah. information to inform what's going well, what's not going well, and continue to improve as an organisation. So, you know, like any organisation, and you'll know we've got the technology to hand, we use Power BI, but it's a case of not just using that performance information to say, right, where are we and what's not working well? It's also, okay, so what's that telling us? Um, we've not got it cracked yet, but definitely we're getting that mindset of, so what's that information telling us? How can we use that to, you know, change what we do, improve, learn from one another, et cetera? So I think it's a combination of all that, if, 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 if I can, John. Yeah, I mean, that's it sounds like real change, you know, as I said at the start of the call, you know, interested in that title, business change and improvement. And it sounds uh -huh. like a massive improvement and it sounds like significant change. Uh -huh. It also sounds to me like by working with your, your colleagues, you're 
providing a, a formidable platform uh-huh. to better serve your customers. Uh-huh. And, and on that basis, I'm wondering what, how you expect those changes to manifest themselves in terms of the service yeah. delivery. Yeah, no, absolutely. Really good question. And I think kind of if you come back to, you know, my role now as Exec Director of Business Change and Improvement, again, is not necessarily unique in the sector. There's quite a lot of us. What might be unique is the fact that I have the people directorate within my team as well. So what I've got together now, I'm saying right at the start when we created the directorate was bringing the relevant teams together. So I've got the people team, the IT team, the business change team. I've got the corporate affairs team, so comms, research, insight, all of that. I've got all of those teams together. And what what I'm what I'm getting across by saying that is, you know, often you look at business change and you think, right, it's a massive project or it might be small projects. They're all aligned to the strategic plan. So they focus on project delivery, new systems, new technology, new ways of working. They might not always necessarily focus on, so how are you going to get the people through that? And that's the thing that we've really invested in. So we've taken a step back with our annual performance reporting. Again, everybody does it, you know, routine one-to-ones, performance check-ins. We do that, we do that well. But what we've done is taken it another level now and aligned that to the strategic planning. So we have what we call a talent and succession plan with all colleagues as well. So when they do with their performance review, at the end of that, we'll have a career conversation with them and we'll say, do you have any aspirations? You know, the answer doesn't have to be yes, because some people don't and that's fine. But if you've got career aspirations, what are they? Do you understand the strategic direction of 13? And if so, how can we work with you to work with us to move you on through the organization? Because if you think about what 13 or any organization will look like in five years time, it will look very, very different to how it looks today. I mean, if you just think about the pace of change in the last 12 months. So being honest with colleagues to say, we've got a growth directorate for a reason. We've got a change directorate for a reason. Here's our strategic direction. These are the sort of people, skills, talent, et cetera, that we're looking for. Are you up for it? Because we want to work with you. Uh, you know, for some people, it, it won't be for everyone. And obviously, we'll work through that. And when we go through change now, because we are doing it more and more often, and, you know, you do kind of get that fear, that anxiety of, oh, God, it hit me next. But by op- by being open and working through all managers to speak with all colleagues to say, look, change is the new norm. You know, we'll work with you to accept it. If you can't accept it, we can have other on- other conversations. But just being really honest with people and saying, look, this is where we're going. These are the talent skills that we need. You know, do you want to come with us? And having those routinely and being open and honest about them and, you know, saying to people, we may not necessarily put you, you know, I'll get down to the to, to the muck and bullets, you know, the times where you might have to put people at risk of redundancy. But if we can do a managed move, if you're happy and we're happy, then let's do that. And let's not go through this long winded process where we all know what the outcome is going to be anyway. Obviously, sticking in line with legal employment, you know, employment yeah. law and all of that, I would add, yeah, yeah. of course. But, yeah. you know, it's, it's about being open, honest and transparent. And because I think if... Well, everybody, I would hope, would know this, and it's not new, that for change to be effective, you've got to take your people with you. And the only way to te- take your people with you is to be honest with them at the start. If yeah, I, makes, sense. makes perfect sense, Heather. I agree entirely with you, because obviously we're an organization that talks to social landlords all the time about improving operational efficiencies. It's a daily mantra. Everybody talks about that. And what strikes me about the way you're approaching it with the 13 is you're recognizing that that has a direct human impact Mm -hmm. on your colleagues. How can it not? Mm -hmm. If you're streamlining, automating, and it can either be seen as the big bad wolf Mm -hmm. or it can be seen as a facilitator for Mm -hmm. them to use the gray matter to do something that's actually more interesting. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I think if you don't take them with you on that journey, it's a, mm-hmm. it's a, a potential loss of a great mm-hmm. resource, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you think about, again, the stuff that we've done with yourselves, you, you, where you can automate, where you can bring artificial intelligence in to do a lot of the transactional stuff that, you know, some people hold on to because it's what they know, it's their comfort zone. But if you can encourage people to say, you know what, if we could automate that, you can then really start to think about that. You know, if we take away that transactional stuff and give you opportunity to, to have more conversations, get out and see more people, you know, when the time comes, when we, we can get out and about but much more. But to have that time and space to really reflect and think and deal with some of the complex cases that we deal with. You know, some of our colleagues deal with some really complex cases on a day to day basis. For me, it's about being you know, much easier to do business with us, but also making it easier for all of our colleagues to do their day job as well and make it, you know, my hashtag up there, you know, a great day at work. That's our whole 
uh, you know, sort of approach at 13. It's about you having a great day at work at the end of the day. We all, well, we don't all have to go to work, but a lot of us do. You might as well make it a good day rather than just a, an ordinary day. I couldn't agree more with you, Heather. And I think, you know, things like automation, process automation, and as you say, AI, they sound scurry, but at the end of the day, if they can take away the drudgery and open uh-huh. up the opportunity for people to be more uh-huh. creative, be more engaged and involved, it's a good thing. But I can uh-huh. fully understand the, the concerns at the start as to why people might, might not go there. So it's great that you're taking people on that journey with you. Uh-huh. I think, you know, we've covered a whole range of things, Heather, and all that remains really is for me to, to thank you for giving us a great insight into how 13 Group is, is operating. And I uh-huh. think it's fair to say that you know, you're definitely walking the walk on business change and improvement rather than just talking the talk, which is uh-huh. something that I see in a lot of different places. Uh-huh. So without further ado, thanks very much for your participation today, Heather. No, and well, and thanks for the opportunity to share that with you as well, John. It's been, it's been good to have a chat. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you. Cheers.